Hi, I'm Frank O'Brien, and welcome again to the InfoAge Spaceflight Lecture Series. First and foremost, I'm hoping that you, all of your family, and your friends have all been safe and healthy during this pandemic. And right now, that's really the most important thing that we have to keep in mind. Now, here's some food for thought. Look up in the night sky sometime and take a look at the almost limitless number of stars you can see. While it looks impressive, know that you're only seeing about 6,000 of the closest and brightest stars in our local neighborhood. That's a pittance when compared to the hundreds of billions of stars in our own Milky Way. If we know where to look, it's easy to pick out any number of planets that orbit our own sun. And with a small telescope, it's easy to see the details of Mars, a crescent Venus, or the rings around the planet Saturn. But did you ever stop to think that some of the stars overhead in the night sky might have their own solar systems? Well, that's a bit of a mind-bending thought since it implies that there might be planets like Earth out there somewhere. And from that thought, it's a reasonable jump to ask, are we alone? Well, we really don't have the answer to that last question. But over the last decade or so, NASA and scientists around the world have been busily cataloging thousands of strange new worlds. Our talk today is about the quest to find those new word worlds and the techniques we use to detect them. Before we start, just a few quick words about me. Many of you already know this, but for about 25 years, I've been one of the editors of the NASA website extensively documenting the Apollo moon landings. And about a decade ago, I was accepted as a NASA Solar System Ambassador. There's about a thousand of us all across the United States that go into communities and share insights on the NASA mission. I've talked at schools and service groups and libraries and museums and computer conferences all over. We're often the first opportunity for those in the community to go and interact with someone who has a direct connection to NASA. This is a fantastic all-volunteer program. No tax dollars are spent on it, and of course, we never accept any kind of compensation. Now, we're very comfortable on our own little rock in space. It's home, and it sustains us. We're going to start with a bit of a sobering thought from Carl Sagan from the Cosmos TV series. We find that we live on an insignificant planet around a humdrum star lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten part of the universe. Now, it's easy to think of ourselves at the center of the universe, but that phrase makes us feel a little bit insignificant. I know it does for me. But for all, much of human history, all of us thought we were at the center of the universe. But the last few decades have brought discoveries that truly reinforce the idea that planetary worlds are common. In fact, when you look up at the night sky and see the stars, understand that each point of light most likely has its own solar system around it. The planets around those stars are likely very different than the planets we're familiar with, but all share the same characteristics with worlds that we already know. Surprisingly, we have found that even our local neighborhood of stars is just teething with planets. 
First, <laughs> we're going to put something to bed before we get too deep into this topic. We are not going to be talking about space aliens, little green men, or anything like that. The question of life of some kind is a tantalizing topic and one that's worthy of a separate talk. Is there life on any of the thousands of worlds we found? Well, honestly, just the work of detecting those planets is pushing the limits of physics and technology. And we simply don't have the ability to find out if there's life elsewhere from our current state and technology. We'll be talking later about what's involved about determining the habitability of a planet, plus other key factors that you know, might be detectable for evidence of life. There's a few generic ideas about what life would look like on other worlds that we'll address, but on the whole, we're going to stick with uh, what we know for sure. I'm sorry, but the answer to the question of, are we alone in the universe? is just simply going to have to wait. So, how do you go about making a planet? Well, you need to start with a bang. A really, really big bang. Like the creation of the universe size of Big Bang. We have no idea what caused it, or what it was like for the first 300,000 years. But shortly afterwards, it cooled enough so that the very first elements were formed. In the beginning, the universe was about 92% hydrogen, about 8% helium, and a very small amount of lithium and beryllium, and that was almost it. These collected together and formed the very first stars. We suspect that these early stars weren't very, uh, 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 were quite large, and they really didn't live very long. Such massive stars burn out in only tens of millions of years, and during their short lifetimes, they create the heavier elements out of the hydrogen and helium. Carbon, oxygen, and other elements necessary for life are created toward the star's end of existence. Eventually, the star collapses upon itself and ends its life by exploding into a supernova. The unimaginable violence these supernovas create have temperatures and pressures so high that they form uh, even more new elements. Sometimes a supernova will be brighter than the entire galaxy it lives in. Now, in a normal, everyday stellar nova, if you can use that phrase, elements up to iron are created. But in these extraordinary supernovas, all of the elements of the periodic table are formed. But a single generation of stars going supernova hardly creates enough uh, dust and elements to form planetary systems. So, most of the remaining, helium and hydrogen, are recycled, if you want to use that word, into new stars. And the cycle repeats itself for billions of years and countless stellar generations. Yeah, wash, rinse, repeat as necessary. This process exists even today. In 2002, astronomers noted the death of the star V383, Monocerotus, which is in the general direction of the star Cirrus. Over the next decade, an exploding shell of dust and gas flew out from the star, which is captured in this video. It is this debris that flies into the interstellar medium mixes with the remains of other stars to create new ones. Over time, the dust and gas collect, it, collect into clouds 
called stellar nurseries, held together by the gravitational attraction of each other and shaped by the flow of the interstellar gas. These clouds contain all the necessary elements to form stars and planets, and more importantly, are dense enough for this process to become a frequent occurrence. Here is a picture of a part of the Eagle Nebula taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, while the name Eagle Nebula might not be a household word, the new given name by the media, the Pillars of Creation, almost certainly is. Here, as in many nebulas, stars and planets are in a constant state of creation. Within these clouds, the abundant hydrogen and helium condense into a small spinning center. Eventually, enough of these elements accumulate that the gravitational pressures are enough to ignite the nuclear fusion process at its core. And the new star is born, shining for the very first time in its life. Surrounding this protostar is a disk of material containing the building blocks of planets. Lots of hydrogen gas, to be sure, but it also has the heavier elements of carbon, oxygen, silicon, and iron. The nascent solar wind pushes the innermost disk, uh, uh, innermost parts of the disk outwards, making the density greater of the disk the further you get from the star. We now have sufficient material close enough together to start the formation of planets. Tiny, nearly infinitesimal clumps of matter start bumping into one another, and then they bump into other bits of debris. Over time, enough material has accumulated that it exerts its own gravitational attraction to bring together even more material inward to the early protoplanet. The dynamics of what type of planet forms in this particular spot from the uh, uh, in any particular spot of the uh, 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 star is very complex and is determined largely by the type and abundance of material that exists in that particular region of the disk. Now, in the last image we had of that disk, planetary disk, you probably thought to yourself, oh, that's a nice painting, and it was. But, you, we, uh, but can we see the planets being formed in real life? Yes, we can. And they are everywhere and, uh, you have a large nebula. The Orion Nebula, which is easily visible on a winter evening, is one where you can see countless new solar systems being created. And while they're not perfectly shaped spinning disks that we saw uh, a moment ago in that painting, remember that nature isn't always as neat and precise as an artist's concept painting. Still, we see plenty of worlds being assembled and at a rapid pace at that. The time needed to go from a slowly spinning mass of gas and dust to a fully formed solar system is only, <laughs> only about a hundred million years. Now, while that sounds like a really long time, and a and hundred million years is, remember that the age of the universe is a hundred times longer than that. While we can see the nearby planetary systems in their early stages of formation, once the planetary disk has condensed into planets, and the rest of the remnants of that disk have blown away, all that's visible from Earth is the parent star. Even though you might think of the stars in the sky as being rather dim, that's from the Earth's perspective, and we're trillions and trillions of kilometers away. In reality, many are as bright or brighter than our own sun, and any orbiting planets are just simply uh, too small in comparison to the size of that star, or are just simply washed out by being in the star's glare. On a practical level, 
and there are many exceptions to this. Direct imaging of a planet is not practical at our current level of technology. Yes, we have imaged directly some planets, but it's very tough to do. So, how do we find the you know, elusive exoplanet? One technique is to indirectly observe the planet by observing the stars wobble as the planet travels through its orbit. This is only possible when there's a really large planet, most likely a planet like Jupiter, which would be a gas giant, and having it orbit very close to its host star. Since a star isn't fixed artificially in space, as a giant planet moves around in its orbit, the two bodies revolve around their common center of mass. To an observer far away, it will appear that the star will move back and forth in sync with the period of the planet. But what if the planets are small or very far away from the star? We have one trick left up our sleeve. In rare cases, very rare, the orbit of a planet lines up perfectly between the star and our view from Earth resulting in a transit across the star. A transit is like a solar eclipse by our moon, but here the image of the disk is much smaller than the disk of the star. Transits aren't uncommon in our own solar system. Every few decades, either Mercury or Venus passes in front of our Sun, and the most recent transit of Mercury was in November 2019, right before the pandemic. Behind me is an image made during the transit of Venus in 2012. And we see a small portion of that disk obscured by the planet Venus. The amount of light that's being obscured by a transiting uh, planet is minuscule, but it is something we can measure. We can think of the problem like this. Imagine a street light down the road, which is surrounded by moths flying around it. The moths are too far away to be seen easily, and even if they were big enough to be seen, honestly, they would be lost in the glare of the light. Every once in a while, a moth will fly in between us and the light, and the street light appears ever so much slightly dimmer. Our human eyes, marvelous as they are, aren't able to perceive that drop off in light, but sensitive detectors can. Now, this technique is very hard to do and is made even more difficult when trying to observe thousands of stars at once. The detection of planets is strictly limited to those of, of, of uh, planets whose orbits are, di again, directly edge on with the, uh, uh, with the line of sight from Earth. And this is a very small percentage to be sure. If the planet's orbit is even slightly inclined to the Earth's view, we're going to miss it entirely. So, this is the best technique we have now, and it's proven to be spectacularly successful. The data from the spacecraft sensors that scientists look at is really quite simple. Starting with the known luminosity of the star, they look for a slight dimming of that brightness, indicating that something is blocking a part of the light reaching the Earth. The amount of the dip in brightness and the length of time the dimming persists reveals important data on the characteristics of that planet. You can see the effects of different planets and their transits in this picture. A small planet in a relatively distant orbit will make a slight dip in the brightness curve for an extended period of time. A large planet orbiting much closer to the star will cause that sharp dip in the perceived brightness and the dip will last a much shorter period of time. Now, of course, there's many other variables that affect these curves, many of which can't be gleaned from just simple light curve data. 
This puts a large amount of uncertainty in the estimates about the characteristic of the transiting planet. Now, although a static diagram like this, you know, uh, this uh, 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 image here is useful, a short video clip provided by NASA helps us visualize the planetary transits and the effect on the received light we observe. Let's take a look. So, that's the essence of the transit method for observing exoplanets. In concept, it's really pretty simple, but the technology to do it is really quite hard. Scientists and engineers have labored, uh, scientists and engineers labored for over 15 years to improve the technology to uh, get to a level where the uh, exoplanets could be reasonably detected. In 2002, they were finally given the go-ahead to start a project to do this. A mission plan that would eventually become Kepler. The spacecraft was proposed in the mid-1990s, but again, several of those proposals were rejected over the next decade as the technology simply wasn't mature enough to put into a spacecraft. Finally, in 2002, Researchers were given the go-ahead and launched Kepler in 2009. The spacecraft was a first of its kind, designed to observe the faint variability of the incoming light from a star, which would indicate that a, tran a planetary transit is in progress. Because no one had a good estimate of the number of transits that might be visible or when they might occur, Kepler is designed to simply stare at the same location in space for years at a time to maximize the chances of stumbling onto an event. They were rewarded for their patience with finding an abundance of uh, planets orbiting their stars, ranging in size from rocky planets that are probably Earth size or a little larger, to gas giants about the size of Neptune and some that are the size of Jupiter. The original mission of Kepler was to observe a region in space about 10 degrees on its side in a region between the constellations Cygnus and Lyra. In the field of view, there's about 145,000 stars that were studied for signs of planetary transits. In the first few years, thousands of candidates were recorded, and about half of those were confirmed to have a planet pass in front of its star. But Kepler's mission wasn't without trouble. An obscure problem in one of the devices used to hold Kepler steady while it's observing began failing. And as a result, four years into the mission, Kepler was unable to hold its attitude to observe that fixed spot in space. Brilliantly, engineers figured out that by using the faint force of the solar wind and using precious maneuvering fuel, Kepler could hold its focus on various points in the sky for months at a time. While it could no longer observe its original planned targets, this new technique allowed scientists to observe new areas of the sky. Eventually, in 2010, with its fuel having run out, Kepler had to be shut down. In the end, the spacecraft returned over 4,500 exoplanet candidates to study. And as of May 2018, 2,619 planets have been confirmed. Now, when we talk about planetary worlds, 
the first question that pops up is, could there be life there? Right now, the only answer we have is, we really don't have any idea. That said, there are some good general rules for habitability and life as we know it. And this is a huge caveat, life as we know it. It's no use speculating on life as we can't possibly imagine it. But to have life with all the crazy diversity that we have here on Earth, it requires some basic things. First, we need lots of the lighter elements, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and these are just the beginnings of the list. We also need water. There's no mechanism for life as we understand it that doesn't require that simple little compound. Life is also a series of chemical reactions which require the input of some form of energy to set it in motion. So, with just these basic parameters, and there's many, many, many more, let's start with the easiest first. We understand very well the type of star we're observing, and we have extensive catalogs going back decades on its temperature, size, and importantly, how stable that star is. From this, we know the approximate distances from the star that a planet won't be too hot or too cold. If a planet is way too hot, hundreds if not thousands of degrees, liquid water just simply won't exist in any quantity, and the heat will destroy any kind of fragile uh, organic compounds. These are organic compounds of the kinds that we find in cells. Too cold and the water will be frozen if it exists there at all. And the necessary chemical reactions for life will slow to a crawl or simply stop. This leaves us with that middle ground called the habitability zone, or more commonly, the Goldilocks zone, where temperatures are neither too hot or too cold, but just right. Next, we look at the size of the planet. If it's small, it's going to be rocky, like the Earth. You can't have a small gas-like gas -like planet similar to Jupiter. But once you get past a certain size, say about the size of Neptune, gas giants are the rule. There are, they are very, very poor in the necessary elements for life, and more importantly, have no surface to accumulate pools of water and other compounds so that they can react together. We have found a few planets which are in this habitability zone around their host stars, but not a lot, but we're continuing our searches. One system that's just particularly interesting is called TRAPPIST-1, a star in the constellation Aquarius. We found not one or two, but seven planets orbiting a very cool, very small red dwarf star. This tiny little solar system has its furthest planet only, only six million miles from its star, as compared to the 93 million miles or so that the Earth is from our sun. The innermost, uh, innermost planet has a crazy attribute. Its entire year, the time the planet takes to go around its star, it's only 36 hours. That's a lot of happy birthdays. In fact, the entire Trappist system would easily fit inside the orbit of Mercury. Now, normally, you would think that planets so close to a star would end up being just molten blobs of rock. But here, it's not the case. The star is so small and so cool, I mean, cool for a star, there's even, uh, and even though the planets are very close to it, several of them lie within that habitability zone. Now, other observations have shown that the TRAPPIST-1 star is very unstable, with major solar eruptions every few days. This fact alone makes the chances for any kind of habitability 
really pretty small. When we undertake these inventories of exoplanets, it's easy to think that the Milky Way is so big. Why have we only found just a few thousand planets? This forgets the idea that we're only looking in a single direction with Kepler, and we can only see about 3,000 light years away. The Milky Way is over 100,000 light years across, and we're not even looking in the general direction of the densest part of our galaxy. So, using a technique which can admittedly only find a very small percentage of planets, it's not surprising that the numbers are smaller than you might want. Our next step in our search for new worlds is to uh, survey the local stars in all directions and build up an even greater catalog of planets. Riding on the heels of Kepler, NASA authorized the development of TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, intended to uh, 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 be a follow-on to Kepler. TESS's ob uh, objective was to perform a full sky survey for the exoplanets that are transiting their host stars. Rather than staring at a single region in space for years at a time, TESS looks at a large swath of the sky for only a month or so before moving on to a different region. The stars it'll be looking at are also much more restrictive. Rather than looking at all stellar types, TESS concentrates on those types of stars that are similar to our Sun, and those that are even smaller and cooler than the Sun. These star types, known as G, K, and M, the Sun is a type G star, are the most interesting because they've been likely in existence for billions of years and are quite stable, and thus have a high likelihood of having Earth-like planets. Larger, hotter stars typically have lifetimes of tens to hundreds of millions of years and would be unlikely uh, uh, to, have, uh, to have candidate planetary uh, objects uh, orbiting around it. Additionally, TESS is looking at stars that are far closer than those observed by Kepler. The furthest stars Kepler looked at were about 3,000 light years away. And this makes observations of planetary candidates pretty difficult. TESS is limiting its search to stars only about two, maybe 300, million, uh, 300 light years away. Still, despite all these restrictions, a catalog of over 200 stars are being studied. Much of this is drew due to the fact Kepler used a large one meter telescope for its observations. TESS's sensors are far, far smaller. TESS observes the sky in one large slice using four high resolution near infrared cameras. Each camera photographs a region, uh, a square region, 24 degrees on a side which is about the size of the constellation Orion. When all four cameras are combined, a full 24 by 96 degree swath is imaged all at once. Unlike Kepler, which again stared at a singular region in space for years at a time, TESS is surveying nearly all of the sky. For a month at a time, TESS images a swath of the sky with each one of its four cameras pointing in a different direction along that swath, allowing for a full segment of a hemisphere to be photographed at once. To complete a full hemisphere of imaging, TESS will rotate about 25 degrees each month and begin a new series of observations. First, the southern hemisphere is imaged, and then after about a year, the spacecraft turns to begin imaging of the northern hemisphere. As you can see, there's a large overlap at the poles, which is unavoidable, but 
offers the ability to observe stars in a region for a year at a time. Here's going to be two short videos showing each of the processes to get a better idea of TESS's mission. The first shows the view of each one of the four cameras and how they're going to be pointed. The second is of how the spacecraft photographs a swath, moves on to an adjacent era, uh, uh, area for its survey, and then, after 13 months, flips from the, looking at the southern hemisphere to start studying the northern hemisphere. Once it's looking north rather than south, that pattern of monthly scans continues. Well, TESS finished its first survey of the sky last year. And because controllers have been incredibly miserly with its fuel, the mission has been extended to conduct another 26-month-long survey. Rather than simply repeating its primary mission, TESS will slightly adjust its, its uh, initial attitude, slightly offset from uh, the original attitude to fill in gaps it had already missed. TESS has one significant limitation, though. Kepler is special because it looks at a spot in space for, you know, I'm sorry, TESS is uh, uh, special because it looks at a spot in space only one month out of 26. Planets with an orbital period longer than that are easily missed, even if the geometry is favorable for observation. Kepler because it stared at a single spot for years, would have been able to see the four innermost planets of our solar system. It's possible that TESS might not see us at all if it was looking uh, at us. And as such, TESS is optimized to see those planets that op uh, orbit very close to their host star. <coughs> Wow, yeah, it's full of stars. This is the first image returned by one of the four cameras on TESS. It's easy to see that there's a huge amount of stars that need to be analyzed, but on the average, only about 2,500 stars in this image will be studied in detail for evidence of exoplanets. The original expectation was that TESS would find about maybe 2,000 exoplanets during its original 26-month-long uh, mission. Now think about this for a second. In a little more than a decade, we have been able to progress from assumptions that, well, we're pretty sure that there's planets out there, but we have no way to prove it, to a rather confident statement of how many we might find. And they were right. In a little over two years, as of April 2021, TESS has discovered about 2,600 potential exoplanets, of which uh, about 100 have already been confirmed. Analysis of the remaining candidates will take months, if not years, to complete. But that was pretty good guesswork. Now, that we have been successful at detecting the simple existence of a planet orbiting another star, which is an amazing feat all you know, in and of itself. We now turn to more complex questions. 
many of these planets are Earth-sized or larger. Do any of them have an atmosphere? If so, what's it composed of? What's the planet's density? Now, right now, we can only make simplistic assumptions about its surface temperature because of the star's luminosity and the distance and whether it's in the habitable zone or not. But what would happen if we could measure it more directly? Neither Task nor Kepler have the ability to answer any of these questions, so we require observatories with a new set of capabilities. The European Space Agency launched their CHEOPS satellite nearly two years ago and is now characterizing these important aspects of the planets we've already found. Late in 2021, exoplanet research will use the immense capabilities of the James Webb Space Telescope to look at some of the known planets. In particular, its powerful spectrometers will be able to determine the composition of an exoplanet's atmosphere, you know, if it has one, and additionally, it will be able to analyze large Neptune, Jupiter, and larger sized gas giants that are known to orbit many stars. As the light passes through the gaseous atmospheres of these planets, we know that any change to the spectra we see are due to the gases in that atmosphere. The brightness of the spectra of the atmosphere shows the relative concentrations of the gases and also gives hints as to how the planet was formed originally. Now, because the idea of life on all of these worlds, excuse me, is too intriguing of a topic to ignore, let's finish by jumping in and saying what is knowable without resorting to science fiction. With this, admittedly, I'm moving into well-reasoned speculation here. We have seen that the planets we've discovered range from smaller, rocky planets that are probably similar to the Earth to gas giants like Jupiter. We also know that these uh, planets orbit in a wide range of distances from their host star and that these stars also vary in size and temperature. One essential point we must always remember. Everywhere we look in the universe, the laws of physics and chemistry are the same. Yeah, in extreme environments such as black holes or supernova explosions, there are physics we honestly don't understand. But these are so beyond our practical experience and certainly outside the realm of whether a planet is habitable or not, we don't need to consider them here. So please refrain you know, from any impulse about speculating about exotic or magical materials or what you saw on the latest sci-fi series. So if there is life, what might we find? Well, it's universally accepted that before large, complex, multicellular life like people existed, individual cells had to be thriving. These usually required a liquid water environment, and this strictly limits the temperatures and atmospheric pressures that the planet can have for liquid water to exist. Gas giants such as Jupiter and Saturn are simply that, just huge balls of gas with no practical surface, except a small core under very, very intense pressure. Certainly, there's no liquid water on these gas giants anywhere to be found. The size of the planet also has an impact about what kind of life you might find. Larger planets generally have higher gravity, and if the Earth was only a thousand miles larger in diameter, say 9,000 miles as opposed to its current 8,000 miles, what weighs 100 pounds would now weigh 150. That's one and a half times normal Earth gravity. 
like life would likely evolve shorter and squatter, reflecting the stronger cell skeletons necessary to support the organisms. The atmospheres will likely be more dense, affecting how respiration might evolve. With a higher gravity and thicker atmosphere, birds would certainly evolve differently, as they'll need to be lighter and with longer wings in order to fly. As an intelligent society, however you want to define that, might evolve, many of the technological advancements that we're familiar with today would certainly come about. There isn't an obvious reason why it couldn't. Except for one thing. Space flight. Space flight. Airplanes or their alien equivalent would probably certainly come about but much later in the technological evolution of that society. But sending a, planet, a satellite into orbit around a large planet or to a moon or other planets would be nearly impossible for inhabitants of a high gravity planet. The reason is that the equations we've used for a hundred years to design rockets show that with chemical propulsion, like the kind we use today, and our propulsion is extremely advanced and efficient, is just not enough to launch a rocket fast enough to go into orbit. We understand this very well, and there isn't a magical workaround available. So, to visit such worlds, we need a radical breakthrough in rocket propulsion, which will probably be nuclear or something along those lines in order for us to visit and return, or perhaps for the inhabitants of that world to leave it all. Think about that. We're finishing up. Next month, what would happen if a large asteroid were to hit the Earth? How would we find out we're in danger and what would we do? It's a real threat to our existence and extensive planning has been going on for well over a decade. Now, like other talks in the InfoAge spaceflight lecture, or unlike them, this one is based only on tabletop exercises that have been going on for a decade. Still, it's incredibly enlightening to know what can, and most importantly, cannot be done. Importantly, we'll be talking about the geopolitical issues involved in the decision-making of what to do if an asteroid is coming to hit the Earth. I promise you, this talk will get you thinking, and I hope to see you on June 27th for it. With that, I hope everyone stays safe and healthy.